So in this final video for lecture eight, I want to do two quick things. Um, first thing I want to do is stress test longest chain consensus by examining it in the partially synchronous model. Uh, and in particular, seeing exactly kind of what breaks down when you can have unbounded network delays. The second thing I want to do is I want to just kind of give a, a very brief recap of some of the key points of lecture eight and uh, package them in a way that you can take them directly forward into lecture nine uh, and basically port over all of, all of this lecture's results into the permissionless model that we're going to discuss next. So for this entire lecture, we've been analyzing longest chain consensus in the synchronous model. Uh, actually, we've even been analyzing it in the supersynchronous or, or instantaneous communication model, which corresponds to the synchronous model with a parameter delta equal to zero. Um, but as I've said many times, and as we'll talk about in more detail in lecture nine, um, as long as the um, time of a round, so the length of time in that, that elapses in between consecutive leaders, as long as that is large uh, relative to the network delay capital delta, large here meaning one to two orders of magnitude bigger, uh, then in fact, everything we talked about today will hold off more generally for the general synchronous model with a known bound delta on the maximum uh, message delay. But what about the partially synchronous model, right? In previous lectures, we made sort of a big deal that if you're running a consensus at the internet scale, right, you have to be ready for sort of, um, you know, network outages that maybe last a long time. You have to be ready for denial of service attacks that maybe last a long time. Um, so what, you know, what, what happens with longest chain consensus when you're dealing with those outages or attacks? And it's actually not that hard to see that, that some of the guarantees we proved for longest chain consensus uh, in the synchronous model are not going to remain true, unfortunately, uh, in the partially synchronous model. Take finality, for instance. This was this was our theorem two, um, which said that you know for a suitably chosen parameter k, you know once a block um, is ensconced in the longest chain with at least k blocks after it, that will be true forevermore. So that's what allowed us to say that in our notation, we had B sub K of G, so a longest chain with the last K blocks lopped off. Uh, theorem two said that that only grows over time. In other words, once a block belongs to that set, it'll never be kicked out again, as long as you have a balanced uh, leader sequence. In the partially synchronous model, however, uh, longest chain consensus does not achieve finality. In the partially synchronous model, right, messages can be delayed arbitrarily. It's true there is this GST, this global stabilization time, after which you kind of revert back to the to the synchronous mode. But remember, GST is unknown a priori. The protocol has no knowledge of it, and it can be arbitrarily large, finite but arbitrarily large. And let's think about a message delivery adversary kind of um, using the power of the partially synchronous model in sort of the simplest possible way, um, which is through a network partition. Okay, network partitions. Um, you re may recall from our discussion of the CAP theorem back in lecture six. And so remember this, what this means. We think about the nodes running the protocol and uh, we divide them into two groups, uh, group A and group B. Uh, and the message delivery adversary is just going to stop all communication uh, between the two groups of nodes. So nodes of A can talk to each other, nodes of B can talk to each other, but they can't compare nodes. Again, no messages are going to be allowed um, to cross that boundary. So just like when we discussed the CAP theorem and network partitions there, um, beyond this sort of adversary controlling message delivery, we're not going to need any other adversaries. So the, the our criticisms of longest chain consensus are going to apply even when all of the nodes uh, are honest, even with no Byzantine nodes. Uh, if you can have unbounded uh, message delays, then even with all honest nodes, you, for example, lose finality. So what goes wrong? Okay, well, so let B not denote the genesis block and imagine, you know, some number of blocks you know, I don't know, 10,000 blocks have been created to date, and then all of a sudden there's a network partition. Well, so now all of a sudden what happens is that each set of nodes, A and B, uh, they're going to just continue to operate independently uh, and unfortunate, unfortunately unaware with what's going on in the other group. So for example, uh, imagine we're just doing simple round robin leader selection, um, you know, like we usually have been in the permission setting under the PKI assumption. Uh, you know, and imagine this network partition happens at, let's call it, time step 100. Okay, so we start out with this really nice long single chain that has 100 blocks in it, no problems at all. Time step 100, there's a network partition, the groups A and B no longer can talk to each other. Then time moves forward, it's time step 101. Remember, it's a global shared clock. All of the nodes in A know it's time step 101. All of the nodes in B know that it's time step 101. All of those nodes, both in A and B, have some expectation of, who, of which leader it's supposed to be right now. So for example, maybe, you know, n equals 40, there's 40 nodes total, and all of the nodes are therefore expecting node 21 um, to suggest a block to everybody else at this time step 101. 
Now, node 21, of course, it's going to either be in A or it's going to be going to, going to be in B. It's not going to be in both. Um, imagine it's in the set A, for example. Then, from the perspective of the nodes in A, everything looks totally normal, right? All of them are going to hear a message um, from node 21, you know, the leader of the current time step. In all of the nodes in A, are like, great, this is the new block. Um, let's call it B sub L plus one. Now, node 21 tries to tell everybody about this block B sub L plus one that it proposes. Um, it tries to tell the nodes in B, but again, remember our message delivery adversary is delaying all of those nodes. So, while things look normal for nodes in A, nodes in B are like, huh, I was sort of expecting to hear from node 21 in this time step, and we didn't. So I just, I guess we're just going to skip this block and move on to, you know, node 22 and time step 102. Because remember, right, for all the nodes in B um, know, node 21 is Byzantine and chose to sort of waste its slot intentionally by not broadcasting any messages. So the nodes in B just sort of carry on, you know, assuming that something went wrong with node 21, not worrying about it, and then proceeding to, you know, listen to the next block, um, which should be coming in from node 22. So the clock then, you know, moves forward, it becomes time step 102. Uh, and so node 22, let's say, is the leader of that time step. Um, and node 22, you know, could be anywhere, but it might well, for example, be in the set capital B. Now node 22, you know, let's assume it's honest, um, but even though it's honest, it has stale information, right? So B has not heard, uh, node 22 has not heard about this block B sub L plus one. It thinks the longest chain ends in B sub L. As an honest node, it's gonna propose a block that extends the longest chain it knows about, that extends B sub L. So it's gonna create a block, let's call it B sub L plus one prime, that also has B sub L as its predecessor. So after node 22 creates this, this block, this block um, B prime sub L plus one, uh, it tries to inform everyone about it. Okay, so it broadcasts this block to everybody. Uh, on the same side of the partition, so other nodes in capital B, they're all going to learn about this block B prime L plus one. Um, and they all have a common view of what the blockchain looks like. No nodes of B have heard about B L plus one. They've all only heard about B prime L plus one. So they're go all of them will think that the blockchain currently looks like a single chain starting at B naught uh, and terminating at B prime sub L plus one. Nodes in A, meanwhile, because of the ongoing network partition, are not going to hear about node 22's block. So from their perspective, right, time, you know, basically they were expecting to hear from node 22, they don't, so maybe they assume that node 22 is Byzantine or otherwise just sort of um, out of commission, and they just sort of say, oh, I guess we're just sort of skipping this step. So after time step 102, all of the nodes in A will have, also have a common view of the blockchain that it goes from B naught to B L plus one. So all of the nodes in A will, will think that the top branch of this fork um, is, is the entire blockchain. All of the nodes in B will think that the bottom branch of this fork is the entire blockchain. And the problem is not just that somehow redundant work is being done. I mean, remember, these two blocks in general are not going to be the same. I mean, even if the node, even if node 21 and node 22 knew about exactly the same set of transactions, even if they packed exactly the same transactions in their blocks, you know, they might well have put them in in, in different orders, because remember, they order them arbitrarily. And I'm sure you can see sort of what happens from here on out. As long as this network partition exists, as long as sort of nodes in A and nodes in B just can't communicate and live in sort of parallel uh, but sort of self-consistent worlds, the two branches of this fork are just going to grow, right? So maybe node 23 belongs to um, set A, let's say it's an honest node. So it thinks the end of the, the unique end of the longest chain is BL plus one. Uh, that's what node 23 will extend. All of the nodes in A will hear about it, etc. You know, node 24, maybe that's also part of A. It will also extend the top branch. Maybe node 25 belongs to set B. Um, it's going to extend the bottom branch because the bottom branch is the only thing it knows about. Now, initially, when we just have the initial fork BL plus one and B prime L plus one, that's actually not a violation of finality, because remember, um, you know, for finality, we always lop off the last K blocks of the longest chain. So the fact that there we have two sort of longest chains that disagree on just their last block, I mean, as long as K is at least one, there's no disruption to finality. But again, remember, partially synchronous model, um, message delays can be unbounded, so the duration of this network partition can be unbounded. And as long as it persists, both branches of this fork um, are going to get extended. The top branch by nodes of A, the bottom branch by nodes of B. If that network partition uh, goes on long enough, um, the length of the two branches is going to start exceeding K. And at that point, the nodes in A and the nodes in B have different opinions about which blocks have been finalized uh, to that point.
Okay, so already at this point, we see that we lose the common prefix property, which was the conclusion of theorem one, which holds in the, in the synchronous model. Once these two branches um, diverge and have gone on for more than k blocks, all of a sudden you do have these um, potentially two different longest chains, which disagree even after lopping uh, the last k blocks. Okay, so that's a failure of theorem one in the partially synchronous model. So what about finality? When does that break down? Uh, well, that breaks down when the network partition ends. Okay, so suppose the network partition goes on for a long time. Nodes in A, and nodes in B, sort of operate in their own sort of self-consistent but different universes. You know, maybe during the network partition, nodes of A added 125 blocks, um, you know, to to their branch, and maybe nodes in B didn't make quite as much progress. Maybe they added 119 blocks to their branch. And, you know, and let's say that the parameter k is something like 50, so let's say that like 69 of those blocks um, in B's branch are regarded as finalized by the nodes in B. Well, then when the network partition ends and all of the nodes compare nodes, right? The nodes in A catch up with what nodes in B have been doing and vice versa. The nodes in B are like, crap, we have to throw out this 119 block branch that we built um, because we're going to be extending the longest chain and the actual longest chain is this 125 block branch created by the nodes in A. So all 119 blocks created by nodes in B during the network partition are going to be thrown out. And so that means the 69 of those blocks that nodes in B had thought were finalized were not in fact finalized. The transactions in those 69 blocks are going to be rolled back. So that's the violation of finality. So this then, you know, is one of the biggest issues with the longest chain consensus, one of its biggest flaws. Uh, longest chain consensus is still useful. It still powers, you know, many of the world's biggest blockchains, but it is important that everyone understand uh, this weakness that it has. Namely, no matter how you set K, no matter how many blocks you wait before you consider a block finalized, um, that finalization might get violated if you have sufficiently long network outages uh, or denial of service attacks. So for example, in our example, we took K to be 50, which is a pretty sizable number, but if the network partition was long enough so that you had these branches that were of the order of 119 and 125, you got 69 blocks getting, getting rolled back, not having finality. So this is a big contrast to the BFT uh, type protocols that we were focused on prior to lecture eight. Um, so, you know, for example, using Tendermint as an example, uh, so remember the way that protocol worked is that a block did not get finalized until you had a super majority of votes in favor of it, right? So it's the permission mission model. You know, there is say a hundred nodes total and no block is considered finalized until you've heard from 67 distinct nodes uh, voting for it to be finalized. And so what that means is that, you know, when you have a network partition like this one, so say half the nodes in A, half the nodes in B, uh, a protocol like Tendermint is just going to stall. Okay, so it's not going to have any violations of finality. It's just not going to finalize any new blocks. Uh, the nodes in A will only ever hear about 50% of the votes. They'll only hear about votes from A, so that's not a supermajority. They'll make no progress. Nodes in B will never hear from more than half of the nodes during the network partition, so they will also make no progress. So in this sense, BFT type protocols like Tendermint favor safety over liveness, right? So um, remember that when, in, when, a, when a protocol is under attack, we know by the FLP impossibility theorem that you, you can't have it all, right? You can't ensure both safety and liveness, you know, throughout um, an attack. So you have to give up one of them. BFT type protocols give up liveness. They just stall, but at least they never violate consistency or, or roll any blocks uh, back. That's very much the traditional approach, which makes sense, right? Like safety properties or stay that sort of, you know, bad things never happen. So it makes sense to say, oh, I guess they should never happen even if we're under attack. You know, liveness properties, you know, traditionally say, you know, something good eventually happens. So it's very natural to say, oh, I guess we should have liveness eventually, meaning after the attack ends. Longest chain consensus, uh, meanwhile, you know, as we see from this example, it certainly gives up on some safety properties while under attack. Like if you have a network partition, you don't have finality. Um, like in the example, uh, 69 blocks got rolled back. Um, you know, on the other hand, interestingly, you do still have a form of liveness in longest chain consensus, even um, when you have, for example, an unbounded network partition, right? Because both sides of the partition, unlike in BFT type consensus, where they don't have enough votes and they can't make any progress, you know, in longest chain consensus, both sides of the partition just kind of plow ahead, right? Both of them make, both of them think they're making progress in their own right. Turns out the nodes in B were not making progress, but the nodes in A, you know, those 125 blocks they created uh, and got added to their longest chain and, you know, the 75 of those blocks that they considered finalized. Once the network partition ends, the nodes in B will be back on board. They'll, they'll actually recognize that top branch as the correct one, all 125 blocks that were created, those are gonna stick around in the longest chain. Those 75 blocks that were finalized, they're gonna still be finalized moving forward. 
So in the blockchain world, you'll often hear people say, you know, longest chain consensus favors liveness uh, over safety or over consistency. Uh, and this is exactly what they're talking about, right? So think about the canonical case of a, of a network partition that goes on a really long time. Um, you know, notice that unfortunately blocks may get rolled back, you know, because a set of nodes may think they're extending the longest chain when they're actually not. On the other hand, you know, one of the groups of the network partition is going to actually be making progress and what will ultimately be, ultimately be uh, the true longest chain. And similarly, people will talk about BFT type protocols like Tendermint favoring safety uh, or favoring consistency over liveness. You know, and here again, this is exactly what, what they mean. And when you have this network partition, um, the blockchain stalls, you will lose liveness, but at least you will always uh, have consistency. You'll never have to uh, roll back any blocks. And this connects very directly to the different ways in which different blockchain consensus protocols fail. Uh, and if you go back, you know, through the news articles in recent years about, you know, different, different consensus protocols breaking down in different ways, um, you, you'll notice that the protocols that are based on longest chain consensus fail in different ways than the ones based on BFT type consensus. For the protocols based on BFT type consensus, you know, like Cosmos would be an example or Solana would be an example. You know, whenever there's an issue with the consensus protocol, like there's a bug in the implementation or, you know, anything else, generally what happens is they just go down because you'll hear about one of those blockchain protocols literally just not processing any transactions for, you know, whatever, 12 hours or some sort of long period of time. And that's exactly because they favor safety over liveness. Liveness is what they lose when something goes wrong. Longest chain protocols, meanwhile, whenever you hear them failing, what you hear about is large reorganizations. Um, and a reorg in a, in, a, in a longest chain blockchain, that's just the same thing as, you know, these 69 blocks um, that, that one thought was finalized actually getting rolled back. That's what it means to have a reorganization. It's a rollback of blocks that were previously thought to be finalized. You don't actually hear about those reorgs much um, in, say, Bitcoin or Ethereum, just because, um, you know, they're so big and, and, and sort of battle tested at this point. But if you look at more um, sort of obscure uh, longest chain protocols, like, say, Ethereum Classic, um, you will see that they've failed... Um, through reorganizations many times over the years. And so this is one of the big reasons that I think longest chain consensus, you know, even though the killer application is in permissionless consensus, you know, as we'll start talking about um, in the very next video in lecture nine, um, I still think it's a super interesting design point in the design space, even in the permissioned uh, setting under the PKI assumption. Right, on the one hand, you know, if you only talk about the synchronous model, right, you say, okay, longest chain consensus, it has liveness and consistency, that's good for up to 49% um, Byzantine nodes. Okay, so that's nice, right? That's higher than, you know, some of the 33%, you know, results we've seen elsewhere. So 49% is definitely not, not trivial. On the other hand, right, have to concede that in lecture two, um, you know, we did have this state machine replication protocol based on the dual of strong Byzantine broadcast um, protocol, uh, which in the same situation, synchronous model permissioned PKI assumption uh, tolerates 99% Byzantine nodes. So it's like, it seems like we traded in 99% for 49%, um, which doesn't seem that interesting. But then once you start, you know, stress testing by relaxing the synchrony assumption, the protocols start looking a little bit less uh, directly comparable. It's not to say one's better than the other, um, but you know you may have a, you know just like in our uh, discussion of the cap theorem, um, based on your application, you may have reasons to favor consistency versus liveness um, when you have uh, sort of network outages and attacks. And so longest chain consensus allows you to pick a different point on that trade-off curve. Right, so historically, you know, up to the point that longest chain consensus was introduced um, by Nakamoto in 2008, uh, up to that point, you know, there wasn't really a choice to be made, right? If there's an attack, you might stall. That was sort of the only option. Um, whereas with longest chain consensus, you now have a second option, which is maybe you keep making progress with the understanding that, you know, some of the nodes will wind up having to roll back uh, some of the blocks that they produce. All right, so I think underappreciated point about longest chain consensus. Um, you only kind of see it when you stress test it in the in the partially synchronous model, which is why I wanted to spend a fair amount of time on this slide uh, talking through this. But it really is, even the permissioned special case, uh, a very interesting consensus protocol. So that brings us to the end of um, lecture eight. So this was a rather important and correspondingly um, rather long lecture on longest chain consensus.
And um, throughout lecture eight, I've, I've tried to you know, focus you primarily on the same setting we were looking at in lectures two through seven, um, namely the permissioned setting, where there's a known set of nodes up front that remains the same and just runs the protocol sort of from the beginning uh, till the end of time, the permissioned setting. I did that for two reasons. Uh, one reason is just, you know, seem natural to maintain consistency with the, the previous six lectures that we discussed, all of which were in the uh, permissioned setting. Um, but a second reason is, is I actually do think it's worth just sort of appreciating the innovations of longest chain consensus uh, in the safe confines of the permissioned model without worrying about all of the additional details required to make it work in the permissionless setting, which is what we're going to start talking about next lecture in lecture nine. And conceptually, the difference between permissionless and permissioned consensus is actually really big, right? So permissioned consensus, you know, you should have in mind, like, you know, IBM buying their seven servers, of course, everybody, you know, those seven servers, you initialize with the names of the other six servers, uh, and that's all fine. Um, but I also encourage you go look into what you have to do to, to run um, what's called a full node for, say, the Bitcoin or Ethereum protocols. Uh, and you'll see that, uh, you know, you don't have to register with anybody. You're not giving anybody a credit card or a social security number. You're just downloading some software from the from the web uh, and firing up and boom, you get to start running the protocol. You get to join the party. So that should seem like a fairly radically different setting. Uh, and it is. Um, and, you know, as we've seen, there's there's a rich literature. There's been, for many decades, there's been a rich literature on distributed computing. But it really wasn't until Bitcoin came out in um, 2008 that we had any reasonable solutions to permissionless consensus. Thinking back to the you know BFT protocol, BFT type protocols we discussed, like say the Tendermint protocol from lecture seven, um, you can kind of see pretty quickly how why it's not so clear how to make those work in the permissionless setting, right? Because those are sort of voting based protocols, so basically nodes are kind of hanging around, you know, waiting to hear from enough other distinct nodes before they sort of agree to move forward, you know, like collecting a supermajority of, of votes on some block before before finalizing it, you know, so you, you need like 67 out of 100 nodes, say. Um, permissionless setting, right, it's not just that you don't know who the 100 nodes are. You don't know that there's 100 nodes, right? Maybe there's 100 nodes today and there's 1,000 nodes tomorrow. So, like, how, how would you ever know how many votes to be waiting for? Now, we will see later um, when we talk about proof-of-stake blockchains in Lecture 12, there are ways you can take a permissioned um, consensus protocol like Tendermint and make it, you know, sort of permissionless, basically by having an outer um, wrapper which selects, you know, which nodes get to run the permissioned protocol for some period of time. So we'll discuss that in some detail in Lecture 12, but really it's, it's longest chain consensus um, that extends just amazingly naturally uh, to the permissionless case, which, which presumably, if I had to guess, is, is the main reason that, that Nakamoto invented it. My guess would be, you know, Nakamoto, you know, fundamentally took it as an objective of, of their work um, to have permissionless consensus, right? Really wanting kind of a, an open network that anybody could use to do um, digital payments, you know, and then, you know, really was forced to invent longest chain consensus, you know, given the, the limitations, the immediate limitations of the BFT type protocols that had existed uh, up to that point. So starting, you know, next in the next video in lecture nine, we'll get into the details of, of how you extend longest chain consensus into the um, permissionless setting. But let me just conclude, you know, with a couple of things from lecture eight you should remember uh, going forward. So the first thing is, you know, you just want to want to remember kind of operationally how longest chain consensus works. So you want to remember that you start with a genesis block, which we're calling B0, which is sort of hard-coded into the protocol. And remember, this is where we have a trusted setup assumption. This is what we were calling assumption A1 earlier in this lecture. Um, you know, we're assuming that this genesis block was created only at the time of the protocol's deployment. So in particular, Byzantine nodes um, should not have any advanced knowledge uh, of what the genesis block is. And then sort of in, in the spirit of our earliest state machine um, replication protocols we were talking about back in, in, in lecture two, um, we're going to have a notion of sort of rounds with each round having a leader who's responsible for creating you know, one or potentially more blocks. Now, in lecture eight, we did not really discuss how this choice was made. We talked about some options, you know, like if you're in the permissioned and PKI model, you know, maybe it's just sort of a global shared clock and you're just doing a, a round robin order, just like in our, in our protocols in the past. Um, in lectures nine and 12 for proof of work and proof of stake blockchains, we're actually going to talk in, in, in quite some detail about exactly um, how this leader selection is done. It's going to be a sort of very important point. So, you know, what I want you to think about longest chain consensus sort of having this module in it, which is kind of the, the leader selection model, modules. 
So there's some sort of black box, you know, which conceptually at least sort of takes in a round number like round 17, you know, and outputs, you know, the identity of some node, you know, node number 173. Now remember, you know, two of our five assumptions earlier in this lecture actually concerned uh, the implementation of this magenta box, of the leader selection box. Right, so first of all, it should be evident to everybody who the leader is. So the leader should be able to prove that they're the leader, um, and no one who's not the leader should be able to um, trick other nodes into thinking that they are the leader. So that's something we're going to, uh, when we actually go get around to implementing the magenta box, we're going to have to make sure that that property holds. Um, also, it's going to be important that nodes are unable to manipulate how this box works. So for example, if it's a randomized box, it's important that nodes are unable to manipulate the distribution uh, from which it's sampling a, a particular node. So finally, you know, what is it that a leader is supposed to do in step 2b? Well, if it's, if it's an honest node, they're supposed to just add a single block to the longest chain. Um, if they're a dishonest node, they can um, propose multiple blocks if they want. You remember we had our assumption A4, which said that, you know, each block, remember each block has a predecessor um, in longest chain consensus. And there is, a, there is a constraint in step 2b that however many blocks you create, um, you must have a predecessor that was created in some round prior to round R. So remember, this sort of corresponds to what we were calling assumption A4 uh, earlier in the lecture, this assumption that, you know, the, the leader of a given round, even if they're Byzantine, uh, cannot um, create, for example, multiple blocks that point to each other, right? That would be a round R block pointing to another round R block, um, nor can they somehow like delay the announcement um, of the blocks in order to um, have predecessors that are created later. So you can't, for example, if you're the round R leader, sort of wait until round R plus 10 and announce some blocks that have um, a predecessor from round R plus five. You can announce them in round R plus 10, but the only blocks you're gonna be able to announce then are ones that have um, predecessors that are from created in rounds R minus one or less. If you watched sort of the videos on the proofs of, of the consistency and liveness properties of longest chain consensus, you'll recall that that assumption A4 <laughs> played a really, really important role um, in those proofs. So again, when we talk about specifically instantiating longest chain consensus in, for, uh, in a proof of work blockchain or a proof of stake blockchain, um, we'll have to make sure that that assumption is indeed met. Proof of work is actually going to take care of itself. It'll turn out to just by the nature uh, of, how, of how it works. Um, a node is actually only going to be able to specify one block period in a given round. So that totally takes care of assumption A4 very easily. Um, proof of stake, we're going to have to be more careful and make sure we're not going to be able to enforce um, that a leader can only create one block, but we'll still be able to, as we'll see, um, enforce uh, assumption A4, which was all we actually needed for the um, consistency and liveness properties of longest chain consensus. So let me leave you with um, kind of the two key takeaways from this lecture, things we proved in this lecture that are going to immediately port over to the permissionless case and basically just effortlessly take care of consistency and liveness for longest chain consensus, even in the permissionless setting. So the first key takeaway is going to basically summarize the work that we did in the fifth, sixth, and seventh um, videos of this lecture. Remember, I've, I factored the analysis of longest chain consensus, its consistency and liveness properties, I factored it into two sort of modules, largely independent. So the first part of it, which was in those uh, videos five through seven, um, we just sort of assumed that the leader sequence uh, had a certain property, okay, the w, ba w balance property for some parameter w. Uh, and we showed that under that assumption, under that assumption only, okay, no matter no matter the reason why your leader sequence might be W balanced, if it's W balanced for whatever reason, you're good. You've got everything you want. You've got consistency and liveness. You know, as long as you choose that parameter K about how many blocks to wait before finalization, as long as you choose K appropriately based on W, you get consistency and liveness. Okay, so a sufficient condition for getting everything that we want was this balanced um, leader sequence. What does it mean to be balanced? Well, with respect to parameter W, that just means that, you know, if you look at the leader sequence and you look at any window of W or more consecutive leaders, it should be that a strict majority of them are honest. A strict minority uh, of the nodes selected over that window as leaders are Byzantine. If you remember the, the statements of those theorems, um, you'll remember that K, the number of blocks we wait till finalization, um, that was equal to W over two, where W is the parameter and R assumed W balanced condition. 
And I want to stress, you actually might want to rewatch, you know, videos um, five through seven of this lecture before going to lecture nine, just to verify that that's, this is actually true. Um, nothing we did in those videos truly used our assumption that we were living in the permissioned setting. All that we needed was the balanced condition, right? So for our purposes, we don't care how many nodes there are. There's just some sequence of H's and A's getting chosen in step 2A, right? All honest nodes are the same. They're just sort of adding a block to the longest chain, breaking ties arbitrarily. All of the Byzantine nodes are kind of interchangeable, right? We're always assuming that all of the Byzantine nodes are sort of acting in cahoots. So it doesn't matter which one you choose. So all that mattered was this sort of sequence of like, where are the H's and where are the A's in the leader sequence that got generated? And knowing only the pattern of H's and A's, knowing only that the W balance in this condition holds, that in any length W or bigger window, you have more H's than A's, knowing only that, we were able to carry out all of the proofs of the common prefix property, uh, of finality, of liveness, uh, of chain quality. Now you should have the question of how on earth are we going to implement the magenta box if it's not the permissioned setting, right? In the permission setting, clearly the magenta box can just be sort of a round robin order based on the, on, the, on the shared global clock. But my point is just that if we assume that somehow that magenta box gets implemented, again, we know nothing else, then as long as the balancedness sequence holds, we're good. We don't need to know how many nodes there are. We don't need to know the names of various nodes. So again, videos five through seven, what we saw that as long as a uh, W balanced leader sequence gets generated in step 2A over the course of the rounds, knowing absolutely nothing else, as long as you have more H's than A's in any length W or bigger window, you are good. You have both consistency and liveness. The obvious question then, of course, is like, okay, uh, fine, but like, why should this hypothesis hold? Why should we expect there to be a balanced leader sequence every sufficiently long window, more H's than A's? Uh, that obviously is going to depend on how these leaders are chosen, right? It's going to depend on the implementation of the magenta box. Presumably, it's also going to depend on assumptions about, you know, for example, the Byzantine versus uh, honest participation in the protocol. So let me remind you of the hard work we did in the fourth video uh, of this lecture, of lecture eight, where we thought about the case of randomly selected leaders. So, you know, for, for simplicity back then, we were again thinking really about the permission model, like there were these 100 nodes that everybody knew about. And we kind of said, you know, what if we implemented the magenta box, not through round robin, but what if just every round we sort of, you know, independently picked a node uniformly at random? Okay, so each of the 100 nodes is a one in 100 chance uh, of being the leader for any given round. So fundamentally, what we proved um, in that fourth video is that if an alpha fraction of the nodes are Byzantine, um, then in sufficiently long windows, you expect a roughly alpha fraction of the leaders in that window to be Byzantine. Maybe slightly more than alpha, maybe slightly less than alpha, but as the window size grows large, you're going to have basically proportional representation of Byzantine and honest nodes. So a, a basically alpha fraction of Byzantine nodes and a basically one minus alpha fraction uh, of honest nodes. And so what that means is that if alpha is less than a half, if you have a strict minority uh, of Byzantine nodes, then at least for a sufficiently long window size, with the window size getting bigger as alpha gets closer to one half, in any case, for any alpha less than one half for a sufficiently big window, you actually will have this balancedness property with high probability. You really do expect to, in all sufficiently long windows, have strictly more um, honest nodes than Byzantine nodes. Now, amazingly, in that analysis, we also were just barely using the assumption that we were in a permissioned setting, right? Because really we just said, okay, look, maybe there's 51 honest nodes and 49 Byzantine nodes. You know, we're going to select one uniformly at random in each iteration. The only property we needed was that in each round, in step 2A, there was a 51% chance of choosing some honest node. There was a 49% chance of choosing some Byzantine node. That's literally the only thing we used about the magenta box implementation that we studied in the fourth video. Okay, when you press when you press for a random sample, boop, out pops a random leader. Uh, bigger than 50% chance it was honest, less than 50% chance it was Byzantine. If you go back and rewatch that fourth video, that is literally the only property that we used. If you have a magenta box that guarantees the selection of an honest leader with bigger than 50% probability, Everything in lecture four holds verbatim.
So a little more precisely, um, if there's some parameter alpha less than a half, now in video four, um, alpha, what it meant was the fraction of nodes that were Byzantine, but really the role of alpha in that proof was just an upper bound on the probability that a given leader would be Byzantine. Uh, and so if in every single round in step 2a, you have at most an alpha chance of selecting a Byzantine leader with alpha bounded below one half, what we showed in the fourth video, we literally that exact same proof shows um, that you're going to get um, a balanced leader sequence with high probability. The parameter w in the w balanceness condition, that's going to depend on how close alpha is to a half. The closer alpha gets to a half, the bigger the w you're going to need. But for any given alpha less than a half, if you can guarantee, okay, if you can implement that magenta box so that every round a Byzantine leader selected with the most alpha probability, you are good. You will be getting balanced leader sequences with high probability. So the point is that the only missing piece okay, of turning longest chain consensus into a permissionless version that has exactly the same consistency and liveness properties, the only missing piece is the magenta box. Right? So in the permission setting with PKI assumption, very clear how to implement the magenta box. Okay, you can do round robin, you can just select one of 100 nodes, each equally likely, whatever. So the question is, if you're in the permissionless setting, you have no idea how many nodes there are, nodes are coming and going all the time, can you implement a magenta box that simply works? Okay, even though the nodes running the protocol are changing all of the time. Not obvious, but that is exactly what we will do um, next lecture when we discuss uh, proof of work. So we need to implement a permissionless version of the magenta box, and we need it to have the property, or we need to make assumptions so that it has the property that in each round it selects an honest leader with bigger than 50% probability, Byzantine leader with less than 50% uh, probability. Okay, technically, there's also one other thing we need to worry about is we do need to make sure we're, uh, we're enforcing that assumption A4, right? So in, in 2B, um, we have this requirement that the nodes created, um, the blocks created by a leader um, have to have predecessors that are in previous rounds. So we have to say exactly why um, our implementations do force that assumption. Um, but the biggest thing is just where's the, where's the magenta box come from? So I hope you feel like we're really close to having um, permissionless longest chain consensus. And we are. The missing piece uh, is going to be proof of work, civil resistance, uh, the subject of next lecture, lecture nine. I'll see you there.